John McEwen, great to have your company on A Breath of Fresh Air. Thanks so much for making time to, to do this. And the reason that I wanted to talk to you is because this episode will go out on the week of your birthday and I was already honouring you um, or honouring your birthday. So now we can actually check in and wish you a very happy birthday. So John McEwen, happy birthday. <laughs> you look just fine. Thank you very much. Um, John, why do they call you the String Wizard? Uh, it's, I don't know. <laughs> I showed up in three, three, three or four different reviews over a few years, and I had an album to make, one of my best bluegrass albums called, and I, I called it String Wizards, plural, because everybody on it was uh, astounding. You know, Jerry Douglas, Sam Bush, David Greer, uh, uh, Roy Husky, the bass player, and um, uh, Stuart Duncan, and they, they hadn't won their awards yet, but as years went by, they all got best of, best of, best of. I'm right. still waiting. I'm still waiting. <laughs> You've done all right. You can't complain. 50 years with Nitty Gritty Dirt Band, and you were the, you were the founder of that group, and you've one been on, one of the founders, excuse yeah. me, and you've been on the road with them and as part of your solo career pretty solidly all that time, haven't you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't you tired? Yeah, that's what I did. <laughs> Aren't you tired? Yeah, right now I am, yes. But uh, showtime's tomorrow. Right. And I had this interview to do and I was and I was doing that and I had to make a quick video for one of the dates and, hey, oh, come on yeah. down to the show tomorrow, you know, whatever. And uh, going on in front of people makes one not tired. Yeah, you, you get that adrenaline rush, don't you? And, and you discovered that love of being out front of people from a very early age. I read that you were actually a magician in Disneyland as a teenager and loved people's attention then. Is that right? When I was 16, I was trying to get a job in the magic shop in Disneyland in Anaheim. It was a dream job. And me and Steve Martin were both trying to get the same job. And strangely enough, we got it the same day in, in May of 63. Yeah. Wow. And, wow. Uh, we celebrated by having lunch in Tomorrowland. <laughs> we, we, we didn't play music yet. We did, we were we were just pals, and then uh, we worked in Disneyland for three years. Amazing. So how did music then? Sent me an email a while back and said, "Look what I found on eBay," and I thought it was going to be a new Picasso or something because he yeah. collects expensive art, and it was the sign Merlin's Magic Shop from Disneyland. <laughs> <laughs> what lovely memories. How did, how did you discover music after that? I was watching a group. My, my brother played guitar and I, after a few years, decided to hang out with my brother and I decided to learn guitar. And after six months, I couldn't play anything that he hadn't taught me. And, and uh, so, hey, can you play this one again? You know, okay. But then I saw a group called the Dillards playing at a coffee house in Orange County. And in Orange County, which was like Greenwich Village of New York, but spread yeah. over miles and miles, yeah. um, the Dillards were hot. And they played seven different clubs, a week here, a week there. They, they'd go all around the, the area. LA is 90 miles by 110 miles, and it's flat the houses there's not many tall buildings like new york you know and you could go was that your husband <laughs> that was charlie shush oh. <laughs> sorry <laughs> uh, anyway so seeing the dillards five six times a month uh for sometimes more uh, I got hooked on Doug Dillard's banjo playing at 16, seven, at 17, uh -huh. and uh, it ruined my college career. What, I, I what, to, what, what were you setting out to become? Well, I was a math major. Right. And I wasn't, when I got my first D in school, 
It was in calculus. And <laughs> you cannot cram calculus. I've been a really good crammer, you know. I don't, do you use that phrase down there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Title. You know? So I've been really good at, and uh, the night before the final, I, I better open this book. And I, I read four pages and I went, what did I just read? You know, and that's how like, it goes. Yeah. I got a D in calculus and I started practicing more. Right. Maths and music kind of go together though, don't they? It what? Maths and music really oh, go right. together. They use the same part of the brain, I think, don't they? I, I think that they're related somehow. Yeah. Math, <laughs> I, I like the mathematics of the banjo. <laughs> a lot yeah. of eighth So, I mean, you've made a huge success out of, out of all the, the strings that you've picked all of these years. Uh, what led you to find what led you to founding Nitty Gritty Dirt Band? And well, why wanted, did you call it that? I wanted to be on the radio. You oh. know, here I am playing the banjo and and I played the guitar a little bit and and I was driving to school one day and I heard this song by a group called The Birds and I knew that that bird playing the bass was Chris Hillman and he was in a bluegrass group. He was a mandolin player from a bluegrass group called the Scottsville Squirrel Barkers. <laughs> Scottsville <laughs> Squirrel Barkers. Easy for you to say. <laughs> in, in, in San Diego. Yeah. And he got the group together and they, they were on the radio. I, I thought, well, if Chris can do it, anybody can. Especially, and so a, a year went by and I was playing with various people. And then uh, Les Thompson called me. He was 17 years old and I was uh, 20. He says, hey, the guys at the music store are putting a group together. Why don't you come down and play with us? And I did. And my gosh, we didn't know what we were starting. I got my brother to manage us. Huh? I joined officially in August, a group that was three months old. And um, by the following February, we had our first radio record, Buy For Me The Ring. And we were wondering, what took so long? <laughs> Do you think the same would happen today if, if a young band started out? Or has it changed so much that those sort of events, those sort of miracles are not possible anymore? I don't know. Uh, yeah, it, it's like they're together five, six years and nothing happens or yeah. they, something yeah. happens and the bass player gets divorced and quits and the, <laughs> the guitar player goes into rehab you know, and, <laughs> and various things happen. Uh, it, it was di it was different 50 odd years ago, wasn't it? It was it was much, uh, much more innocent times. Well, I don't know. Uh, about the innocence. Um, you look at the innocence, the innocent people that were started doing drugs and they started drinking just like their predecessors. And then the drugs took over. And yeah. I heard an interview with David Crosby a couple years ago where somebody asked him, what about the drugs? And he said, the drugs didn't do any good. No good at all. They didn't do any good. I wish I hadn't taken them. I, but I did, and I got a, I wrote some music, but they didn't do any good. <laughs> I, I wish he had said that 30 years previous. <laughs> because they, they, the good they do is outweighed by the bad that follows. Correct. Or that I, lingers on. Or yeah. that, you know, even marijuana. Oh, it's legal now. Oh, great. You know, there's... Yeah. There are a lot of problems with that in the states. I, I know a friend of mine in Colorado, obviously. I where it's like, Colorado. I was, yeah, what happened? That the young kid is, <laughs> his young kid is completely addicted at seventeen or eighteen and has to go to therapy once a week to try and get off it or at least manage the habit. Yeah, I think it's opened a whole Pandora's box legalizing it, hasn't it? Yeah. Um, anyway. wh why? John, John, why did you call the band Nitty Gritty Dirt Band? It's a rather strange name. We were sitting around and one guy says, well, we got this job. What are we going to call ourselves? And one guy says, well, what about the Dirt Band? And the other guy says, well, I thought Nitty Gritty Band would be good. And I said, well, what about putting them together and call it Nitty Gritty Dirt Band? <laughs> okay, that was it. 
<laughs> and it, took a little less time. <laughs> and it stuck. How amazing. Did you did you ever question that decision or it just grew on you often, and often questioned it because the name was strange and it sounded cute or it sounded contrived or it sounded like somebody made it up that was trying to make money. Well, we weren't making money, but uh, we were making recordings. And um, it, it was uh, in, in the, by 1978 and 80, it was a detriment because we had American Dream was a pop hit and the radio did not identify it ever. They said, well, that was the, uh, an American dream. And next coming up, we've got Logan to Messina or whatever, you know. Really? They didn't want to say, they didn't, just didn't want to say nitty gritty dirt band because it sounded like they were saying 1910 Fruit Gum Company or something. <laughs> and, of, you know? and of course, the music kind of didn't really go with the name at all. It didn't, the, the two didn't really match, which it was a bit of an anomaly. And that's why in the late 70s, the guys voted to change it. Let's call it the Dirt Band. Everybody calls us the Dirt Band anyway. And I'm going, mistake, mistake. <laughs> well, three albums later, they voted it back in. To be, <laughs> we voted it back in to be nitty gritty Dirt Band because you can't throw 10 years of marketing out the door. No. And you can't, well, we, we, we send out an album to record stores. Where are they going to file it? Well, they'll put it <laughs> under nitty gritty Dirt Band. Yeah. Well, these people in the store don't know. They just say the dirt band. Okay, I'll put it under D. You know. <laughs> you know. So d did it have an impact? That name change? Yeah, we went to country music. We started recording in Nashville, and um, we had twenty-one country top twenty records. And uh, a long hard road was the first number one record. It's 17 years into the existence of the group. Jimmy Ibbotson sang. He was a new guy that joined when we made the Uncle Charlie album, which was our fifth album. Yeah. It had House of Pooh Corner, uh, Mr. Bojangles. Love Sons that Charlie song. Food, and um, it put us on the map on the road. It was our fifth album. And it still took from 1966 when we started, it took until 1981 or two for a long hard road to be a number one country song. And, and that was a struggle. So it, it. yeah, are you saying that when, when you drop the nitty gritty from the name, you also had a change in the music genre? Or was that, was that coincidental or when, when, when what was the impact when you actually changed the name when you dropped the nitty gritty other than record stores not knowing where to file the albums well that didn't last very long we were searching we were trying to make albums that were different or well uh, maybe this could be more like little river band best vocals on the road little river band but when glenn shorrock left and b Burtles left yeah. anyway um, some, some of the music was, it was older, it grew up a little bit, right. but it was right. still, it was still like this, you know, right. Right. and, right. uh, it just wasn't there yet. Yeah. But, it, it... Uh, when we went to country music in 1981, I believe it was, and we recorded Dance Little Jean, you familiar with that one? Yeah, I am. Well, that was Jimmy Ibbotson wrote that song about his destroyed marriage that he had. <laughs> and he played it for his ex-wife. He says, what do you think of the song? She goes, it's a fine song. Send me the money. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's over. Oh, uh, the, song, the song made it to number seven, but it got requested like it was number one for a long time. It must so, have resonated with a lot of people. Yes, it did. <laughs> as Jimmy did. Jimmy was the heart and the soul and uh, of the Dirt Band. We, we, he and I worked together quite well, playing off of each other. Why? Did, was it a conscious decision to turn yourselves more and more towards country? Yes. Why did you do that? Are, oh, okay. Well, Sorry. The, the new manager that was taking over from my brother's management, my brother 
took photos, produced the records, and managed the group for uh -huh. or up until seventy eight or nine. <clears throat> and uh, so he had twelve years in it. And I said, "There's only one man that can handle the band, and I think that's Chuck Morris." Uh, we called Chuck Morris in Denver, who's one of the presidents of AEG and uh -huh. Entertainment Group. And he was managing then. And he goes, well, are you going to stay in the band? I said, I'll stay in the band for five things. One of them being we get a national record deal. Two, we record country music the way we can do it. And only we seem to do it. Three, Jimmy Ibbins is back in the band because he had been out a few years. And whatever the other two were yeah. and uh and but i wanted to record country music and ibby sings he sounds country so it's kind of <laughs> you're stuck with it and and when we went to nashville we made a record deal and blah, blah, you know and, and it started working with warner brothers what why, why was your passion so for country though i mean you'd had this blend of of country folk sort of americana i got a group for you they have acoustic guitars a harmonica player, a banjo and a mandolin player, and a guy that also plays the lap slide like the old 50s country songs. Your country. A guy that sings kind of like he's country. <laughs> why? He was right in front of us. You know, <laughs> often, often people don't see what's right in front of them. Yeah. That, that is the easiest path. Take it. They carve one out that, well, you know, that's really good, but I've done that, or I, 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 I'm going to, yeah. I think I'm going to write the next War and Peace. You know, <laughs> and, so, uh, so before that, you'd been following different musical influences and trying to create something from the group that, that perhaps wasn't your, well, I mean, it was still pretty good, but it, it wasn't what you did best, obviously. No, there's an album called Jealousy that was the last effort at dirt band rock and roll that was a failed, <laughs> miserable piece of work. <laughs> yeah, I guess that'd make you sit back and reassess things, wouldn't it? But uh, after that, the country music, hey, that went to number 12, that went to number seven, that went to number one, that went to number two, this is another number one. Yeah. Gee, they're pretty friendly over here. And you know what's weird? You've heard the country music, the country music hall of fame. Sure. Well, they have stars on the walk, on the walkway in front, yeah. across the street. We got a star right out the front door, right between Elvis and Merle Kilgore wow. and Hank Williams Jr. I Hank wow. Williams Sr. The wow. real Hank Williams. Hank Williams Sr. Right. And, Prime position. And and Garth Brooks presented it to us. Amazing. So, and that was 10 or 15 years ago. And I'm going, how did that happen? I was in Orange County two days ago, learning how to play the banjo. And now, okay, yeah. well, that's nice. <laughs> Time has a way of doing that, doesn't it? I'm chatting with John McEwen from legendary Nitty Gritty Dirt Band. Um, John, um, 50 years has, has gone by. You've now left Nitty Gritty. Uh, they're still, are you still playing with them at all? Or do they no longer exist? No. <laughs> what, which, which one? No. I'm not playing with them. Right. But do I they still, and do they exist? Yes, they do. They play uh, the finest Indian casinos in the country. <laughs> I gotcha. And what, what of, of, of all the amazing music that you did make with them, do you have they a particular favorite? Regular, they play some regular halls too. And stuff. Yeah, I, I won't, I won't and, put them down. But, it, it's just Jeff and Jimmy from the original group, and uh, the keyboard player has been there since '78 or '80 or something, and uh, and then a couple other people. And what was your question, ma'am? What's uh, of all of those fabulous tunes that you made with them? Do you have a favorite? I just say anything on the album will the circle be unbroken. That's definitely your favorite album pick one out. Well, that just has a lot of great music on it. And it's not by us necessarily. Oh, I, I wrote one of the songs. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it's just, it was a collaborative effort. And Mr. Bojangles, Dance Little Gene, uh, Ripplin' Waters, um, 
and you know different things come to mind. Well, they say they say about Mr. Bojangles that that was the best ever cover version of of the song ever done. Uh, I, I mean, you're you're infamous for your cover of Mr. Bojangles. I don't. I, I f find it funny that people still call it a cover record when it was it was the hit. <laughs> it was on the charts thirty six weeks. Thirty six yeah. weeks. That's three quarters of a year. It wouldn't. That was a record that wouldn't go away. Yeah. You know, yeah. it it really. Uh, Jerry Jeffs went up to number seventy nine and disappeared when he put it out. Sorry about my computer, but that's um, okay. That's okay. Um, yeah, no, it's a it's a brilliant. <laughs> I won't call it a cover. It's a brilliant song, and you guys do it fantastically. We were lucky, well, we were lucky to get it. Um, if it hadn't been for a certain Catholic girls' school in Manhattan, it wouldn't have been in the top ten. Oh, there's a story there. Tell me about that. Well, Come it on. wasn't on ABC in New York, and the guy that programs ABC had said, "I'm not going to play that nitty gritty dirt band record." Blah, blah, blah. If he didn't play it, Boston wouldn't play it, Cincinnati, Chicago, uh, St. Louis, you know, other major stations followed ABC. Yeah. His, his name was Rick Sklar. His daughter went to a Catholic girls' school in lower Manhattan. And if we played the school, yeah, you might get considered again. So here we were setting up at a Catholic girls' school on a Friday morning junior high school wow. <laughs> you know, long tables leading up to the stage it was like las vegas with chocolate milk <laughs> and uh, the sister walked in and i said uh, pardon me sister who else has played your junior high for your girls oh this year we've been very lucky we've had oh the jackson five boy they can dance and aretha <laughs> franklin aretha franklin and and oh oh that that uh Oh, what, what is his name? Uh, si uh, Simon? No, Paul Simon. That's it. Yes. And early in the year, Mr. John Lennon. What a nice, you know, the British boy. You know him. <laughs> you boys need anything? I said, no, we're getting ready for an important show. And we played the 1130 lunchtime soiree on Friday. And Monday, driving out of New York, I had the radio on. ABC, and the guy said, <clears throat> here's a new song by the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band, Mr. Bojangles. And it went to number nine. And it was on the charts, as I mentioned previously, 36 weeks. Amazing. Amazing. So everybody else had played there for the same reason. Pardon? Everybody else had played that school for the oh, same reason. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's oh. hilarious. I, I they didn't just, oh, we're the Catholic girls' school. Let's go play it. <laughs> oh. Sorry to state the obvious. Oh, that That's incredible. Um, John, I had a look at the, um, you've written a book uh, fairly recently also that uh, climbed to the top of the, of the booksellers list too because you've got some sensational stories to tell in that book. And Why wouldn't you, 50 years on the road? There's some good stories in there. When I finished the manuscript and they had to turn it in for final print, you know, and say, here it is, I had to read it. I couldn't put it down. <laughs> you're, you're hilarious. <laughs> but it really, I go back and read some of the, I go, you know, there's, you can get depressed doing certain things. I, you can and you can't or whatever and it's, I haven't eaten for 12 hours and the flight's late and the yeah, yeah. not ready and the, the promoter ran with the money one, one guy well I can pay you or I can write you a check he had a suitcase full of crumpled dollar fives and tens I'll write me a check he did that to everyone and he left that concert venue with $47,000 in cash but the checks bounced yeah. Uh, you know, I, I had no idea I was going to play Mickey Mouse's funeral. Um, Did she? Uh, yeah, his wife called me and told me, <laughs> my husband just died. And he was your biggest fan. What did he do? Well, for 35 years, he was the voice of Mickey Mouse. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do, ma'am? I'm the voice of Minnie. <laughs> I thought she was putting me on, but it was true. I played her funeral, too, darn it. <laughs> I left here. 
<laughs> but uh, I played his funeral, and I'm right. standing next to the casket doing a 20-minute set, you know. And she says, it's time for the song. She hands me his banjo, Wayne Allwine, is his name, was his name. Is it is or was when somebody dies? It, 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 it is his name. Doesn't matter to me. And she said, it's time for the song. And so there I am. Now the time to say goodbye to all your company. And I, it, it, the song, everybody in the field at the gravesite was singing it. And not just people. I mean, Pluto and Goofy and Mickey and I mean, <laughs> Donald and, you know, all the characters were there. All dressed and, in costume. No. Oh, just just people. people. And, you know, the part where it goes, uh, Oh, Mickey Mouse. Donald, Donald Duck. Duck. <laughs> it wasn't just some jerk that yelled Donald Duck. It was Donald Duck. <laughs> you know, it was. I. How surreal. I'm next, I'm next to the coffin, and I never, I never did drugs. I'm so glad I didn't, because <laughs> they would have kicked in, and I would have been floated away. But I'm next to the coffin, and and she comes up, Minnie, uh, Rusi Allwine. And I get to the part, M-I-C. She goes, see you real soon. <laughs> K-E-Y. Why? Because we love you. M-O-U-S-E <laughs> as the coffin goes into the ground. <laughs> you can't write it. I, I wrote it, but I wrote, only wrote what happened. Uh, unbelievable. What year was that? Well, his funeral was 19... I mean, uh, 2011, about, and right. hers was 2021. I don't know. COVID well, years. Messing up. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It was COVID. Uh, it was, how, how, how amazing that you've come full circle from starting off in Disneyland in Anaheim to, to playing yeah. at Mickey and Minnie's funerals. Unbelievable. Yeah. And my daughter, my oldest daughter, you now she's not a little girl. She's 51 years old. But... She has a, a Steamboat Willie tattooed on her back shoulder, you know, the, the original Mickey Mouse. <laughs> and she, was, she had to go to this funeral. And I, so, I said, I'm so glad my daughter's finally in a place where people will appreciate one of her tattoos. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine all your life you didn't appreciate. It's, it's terrific that you're still out on the road doing your stuff. You're a fabulous storyteller and a brilliant musician. Very glad that uh, you didn't stick with selling in that magic shop in, in Anaheim mm -hmm. and even more glad that you didn't become a mathematician or something. It would have been a very wasted talent. Um, I wouldn't have had much of a book. <laughs> no. <laughs> and the life I picked is the book and it's available on Amazon. And Fantastic. It's, uh, I'm really proud of it. Yeah. And People have told me they couldn't put it down when they read it, so I appreciate that. But if you're married, don't get one and leave it laying around or your husband or wife will take it and read it. <laughs> John McEwen, thank you so much for sharing your time and stories with us. It's really appreciated. Great to meet you. Thank you. It was nice meeting you. And a very happy birthday to you. Thank you. You know how you can say happy birthday to me? <laughs> Play Return to Dismal Swamp. You know that song? I don't. That's well, tell me about that. It's on my String Wizards album, the white one. Um, okay. It's got the best players on it uh, joining me. It's one of my better pieces of music. Or Acoustic Traveler off the Made in Brooklyn album is really good. Uh, you know, it's hard to say. Yeah, this is really good, but they're the ones you they're the ones you're most proud of. We'll have a listen to both of them now. We'll definitely have a listen now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Keep well. Hope to hope to chat again in the not too distant and see you over here. Always available. Thank you. Pre really appreciate your time. Thanks, John. Bye. Good on you, mate. Thank you very much. <laughs> Bye now. Bye-bye.